Hello again, I'm Angela Taylor, your host for Unlocking the Club. And today I wanna to start this episode out by talking about the important role that teachers and educators play in our lives. Uh, and uh, the reason I wanna talk about this today is it's shown up consistently in a lot of the conversations I've been having with our Unlocking the Club podcast guests, whether it was uh, Lenora Williams-Clark talking about some of her teachers implanting the thought that she could be a lawyer in her mind, uh, or if it was Latanya Story who was talking about those teachers that played a really important role in her journey, or uh, Felicia Hall Allen who talked about uh, not just her grandmother um, supporting her dream, but Coach uh, C. Vivian Stringer um, advocating and nurturing that dream and many teachers along the way also supporting it. It's so important the role that educators and teachers, whether it's formally in school systems that kids are going to or in after school programs, the role that these advocates and educators play in their lives to let them know the possibilities, to let them know that they're seen, that their superpowers and their gifts are true and that someone sees and believes in their capabilities. And when I think about and go back to listen to these episodes on the weekends, it just really resonated with me how often that theme shows up in, in our conversations. And I know the same was true for me. There are so many teachers or coaches or adults in my life who believed in me, believed in my dreams, encouraged both my brothers and I, frankly, that we had so many possibilities and opportunities to do things that we loved and that we we're passionate about. And you know, a few years ago, I read an article it was actually a white paper um, talking about lost Einsteins. And wow, um, if you haven't heard about lost Einsteins, I encourage you to, to read about it. Um, because I think that this actually, unfortunately, is taking place in many school systems and communities around the globe, but specifically here in the United States. And, and the white paper talked about these young people who are bright and intelligent, yet someone doesn't see that in them. And early on in their journey, it could be between second, third, or fourth grade, where teachers basically count them out and think that they don't have the capability to be something or someone. And those children feel that, they get the sense of it. They aren't selected for opportunities like those gifted and talented classes. They aren't invited to summer camps where they can continue to um, pick up on the, the expertise or something that they're really good at. And they're lost, right? lost so early on in their journey. And I think about so many of my colleagues and friends and family members or articles or books that I've read where someone has said that a teacher told them that you'll never be that thing, right? When we have those career days and, and kids talk about that, I wanna be a doctor or a lawyer, where somehow, some way there's an adult in the room that says, mm, that dream's not possible for you. And I just can't imagine like what would compel someone to say that and how important that role is in our lives, but certainly our children's lives. And I think about this passion that I had growing up, this shared love for math that I actually had with my mother. My mother um, was really good at math. Uh, she was a math major at Texas Southern University uh, and wanted to work at NASA. I think I've told uh, many of you on um, previous podcasts, but she wasn't able to live out that dream uh, as uh, she got married early and um, uh, was a military spouse before she started to work in the school system as a paraprofessional. Uh, but I think about my love for math early on and those teachers, those math teachers, those science teachers, uh, Mr. Hillsland in my chemistry class, Mr. Thorne in my physics class, who encouraged me, who believed in my ability and who supported my interest in math. I think about receiving that, that letter from Georgetown, a Georgetown camp, it was an actuary camp one summer. And I remember I had a choice, do I go to basketball camp or do I go to actuary camp? And I, and I thought about it for a second, but I said no. And I said no, because I didn't know if my people would be there. 
I looked at the brochure and there was no one that looked like me on the camp brochure. So I decided not to apply for that camp. I think about my freshman year at Stanford University where um, I was on work study before I decided to walk onto the women's basketball team and eventually I earned a, a, a scholarship. Uh, I had to help support uh, and pay for my books and, and room and board and tuition. And uh, so I was on work study in the engineering library. And I just remember it was on the opposite side of campus. And so as I was trying out for the basketball team, we would have a really challenging day on the track or in the gym and working out. And I would have to get on my bike and, and bike all the way across campus to the engineering library late at night. And um, it was a pretty low key job. It wasn't uh, too challenging. But what I recognize that despite the fact that I thought I was gonna major in engineering, I thought I was gonna be an industrial engineer, that I didn't see anyone who looked like me coming in and out of those doors to the engineering library. And I was like, maybe this isn't the major for me. Despite the fact that my brother, two years older than I was, was in fact an engineering major on that same campus. But I didn't see too many women and I didn't certainly didn't see very many African-American students um, or black students or um, Latino students that were coming in and out of those doors. And shortly thereafter, I decided to not major in engineering. And then I think about 10 years after graduating from Stanford, reading this article about a young woman who was studying computer science at Stanford. And she talked about her experience as one of the very few black female students in computer science and how she didn't feel safe at night entering into some of those buildings and how she heard students laugh at her and bully her. And that despite the fact that she was committed to continuing her journey in computer science, it wasn't comfortable. It didn't feel safe. It didn't feel like you were welcome and you were valued in those situations, right? And so the work that I do today, so often working with tech companies or large organizations who are always talking about the lack of diversity in the pipeline, particularly for engineers or developers, et cetera. And you think about what if those seeds were in fact planted in a student's mind when they were in first, second, and third grade? What about all those lost Einsteins? Could we stop having this excuse about there not being a pipeline of talented folks um, that have the capability and the capacity to not just survive some of these domains, but to actually thrive and bring tremendous value um, to all of these different spaces and startups and technology companies. And so I'm really excited today to be in conversation with someone who is actually encouraging those lost Einsteins and giving people hope uh, and encouragement and access to the resources that they need to actually lean into all of the talent and the gifts that they possess and creating opportunities for them to thrive in the corporate space. Today on Unlocking the Club, our special guest will be Nicole collins Port. Welcome to the Unlocking the Club podcast, where we host honest and direct conversations about journeys of access, personal truth, and reclaiming space. We share our truth so that you can find the key to own your truth, honor your journey, and reclaim your space. Grab your keys, your wallet, your phone, and invite your friends to meet you at the club. Here's your host, Angela Taylor. Today on Unlocking the Club, I will be joined by Nicole collins Pori. Nicole is a social justice visionary, strategist, advocate, and mentor who has committed her life to unleashing the potential of untapped communities. She's the CEO of TechBridge Girls, a nonprofit organization that excites, educates, and equips girls from low-income communities through STEM, empowering them to pursue STEM careers and achieve economic mobility and financial security as adults. Nicole is a master collaborator who is able to leverage her rich professional experiences in tech, philanthropy, and education to bring diverse groups of stakeholders together to urge social change in our communities. As explained in her recent TEDx talk on reimagining the STEM revolution for every girl, she's committed to removing barriers and increasing access and opportunities for all those who are often left behind, but essential to the success and growth of our society. 
Prior to TechBridge Girls, Nicole worked at at and where she spearheaded their diversity and inclusion efforts and worked at the College Board where she advised states on their college completion strategy for Black and Latinx students. And at the Women's Foundation of California, where she advanced women's economic security by supporting and awarding grants to visionary grassroots organizations. Nicole holds a BA in political science from the University of South Florida and an MPA from City University of New York. Thanks for tuning in as we unlock the club with Nicole Collins Puri. Nicole, how are you doing? Angela, I'm doing wonderful with the extra hour of sleep. You know, things are very good. It is today. amazing what uh, an extra hour of sleep will do for you, for sure. For sure, for sure. Awesome. Well, Nicole, thank you for joining us today. You know, just read your bio, so impressed um, by all the things that you've done over the course of your career and what you're currently doing. Is there anything else that our listeners should know about you? Well, I am a mom of a seven-year-old, amazing little boy seven. named Xavier. Oh. <laughs> seven. Um, he is literally sunshine walking. Um, every day has been a blessing to just see him grow into this amazing little boy. And it is probably the greatest gift that I didn't expect that has been giving year after year after year. So I always say that is that is something that folks don't know about me, but I do have a seven-year-old. Yeah, well, and I imagine, Nicole, that being a parent and a mother, particularly with the work that you do, gives you great perspective. What have you learned about yourself or the work that you're doing or the importance of the work that you're doing as a result of being a mother? <laughs> you, well, you learn a lot, but I will say this. I learned that balance is a an imaginative thing <laughs> that we don't always get it at the same time that you know one day I will be rocking as a wife and I'll be like eh as a CEO the next day I'll be killing it as a mom and be eh as a wife and then at one day I'll be rocking it as a CEO and falling way short as a mom and a wife and all of that is okay. And all of that is about the balance. And so I think when I finally figured out that there is not this like amazing juggle um, that goes, you know, as smooth as you see a clown do it, but it has, you know, sometimes the balls drop, you pick them back up, start over again, you start with a different color ball the next day and it goes up and you get it through a full round and that's okay. So for me, I just have really embraced um, that balance is not necessarily the end game, but it's really driving to like joy, peace, um, understanding and grace for yourself as you walk this journey called life. No, I appreciate that. Clarity, like right, because for for most of us early on in our careers, there was this thing called balance that you thought it was like, and who you know, who are these purveyors of balance? Like, who is doing it perfectly? But there is no, no such thing, right? It's what it, whatever it means to you. And and as you were sharing such great perspective about the realities of the situation, it reminded me of a recent um, ed episode we have here on Unlocking the Club with Edward Kemp who was talking about being a first time parent and um, how challenging it's been of while you're thrilled with those moments of being able to be a parent and, and all those new experiences that you have, that there's also some grief for the things that you are leaving behind um, mm -hmm. and the choices that you have to make or the things that you may have to give up as a result of it. And I wonder the great perspective that you have and you, you just shared, did you always have that or how did you get to that point? Well, I, I didn't always have it because, you know, especially what this podcast is about being a black woman, we don't give our, we are not given the grace to fail or to let balls drop. Right. So it took me until I was a parent and had to make trade-offs and, you know, as a wife with a son, 
knowing I needed trade-offs because I'm very clear at the end of the day, I'm sure the tombstone and people will talk about my accomplishments professionally, but it's going to say beloved wife and mother of, Mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that the beloved is there, that, that I am present, that I am loving, that I can show up in my full self with the energy that both my family needs um, in a way that it doesn't allow you always to juggle to the place of perfection, right? Like I can't always be on top of my career and be on top of my home and be the best of all the other things. So I had to learn when I started to see things fall and I had to be like, "Mm." Well, what's the trade-off? The trade-off is I get to spend time with my family or the trade-off is, you know, I have more energy to do that thing that is really important to that family member. So um, it was a real tough lesson. And I think the, the balls that dropped were significant, but the understanding that things didn't fall apart Mm. gave me assurance that I could do it. Yes. Such a great analogy, right? The balls dropped, but they, right? They didn't, they weren't destroyed. Yeah, it wasn't shattered. shattered. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't pick it back up and start again, you know? And to a certain extent, many of our life experiences are built to bounce back. And yet, and still, oftentimes we still have that fear of letting them hit the ground or putting one down and setting it aside while we focus on something else that needs to be the priority in that particular moment. Like who or what gave you that grace? I I think it's funny. I think I did not allow for the grace to be received until probably, I don't know, recently, within the last five years, people were probably giving me grace all through it, but I couldn't receive it because I was so focused on having to have every I dotted, T crossed, be at a high level of excellence, you know, lean into this thing called perfection, which is totally a waste of energy and time to like try to live up to that standard. But the reality is that's, that's what it was. And that's um, who I leaned into because I was trying to unlock the club. Now that I know that what the club is, I don't want that club, (laughs) but you know, um, but the reality is that's what I thought I had to do to be able to sit in this position, this leadership type position that I always dreamed about or having, you know, the sense of power and privilege that allows me to make decisions that can impact lives and and transform um, mindsets and behaviors and systems. But the reality is, yeah, I was probably always given grace. Mm. But it took me a long time to actually receive it. Wow. Which is a skill. It's a technique. There's an ability that we need to be able to tap into in order to receive the grace. And I wonder, I talked a little bit about planting seeds in the opening. Where and how is that seed planted in many of us, particularly Black women, where we feel there's so much expectation, where we can't mess up, we have to be perfect, we have to get it right, we have to dot the I's and cross the T's. Where do we get that from? Do you have an idea of like how that comes to us? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, bottom line, it's a white supremacist culture in which we live in. It's what we've been indoctrinated to. It's what we're accustomed to. We are trying to continue to fit in a box that was not meant for us to be, period. (laughs) Especially women in leadership, especially, you know, Black women in general. There is no space that had us in mind in a productive, leading, (laughs) you know, powerful way. So the reality is, is that we've been navigating because we've been told in order to be in the club, in order to get through the door, in order to make other folk comfortable with you, you need to have this, you know, triple tax 
um, to be able to navigate these doors and these rooms that weren't meant for you in the first place. Yes, period, point blank. Like that, that has been, and, and thank you for going there. And that is exactly what we're trying to do on Unlocking the Club is um, there are others who look like you and I, uh, and there are others who um, interact with folks who look like you and I, and they may kind of hear the story you're passing, most likely not the real, real story, um, but I think sometimes it's been discounted. Like, oh, like I have it tough too. And right, and, and we're not here to say that no one has challenges along the way um, as you seek that balance that you um, so perfectly illuminated and amplified. And right, being a black woman in these corporate spaces is challenging. And so often we feel alone. So often we're not sure because you look ever, elsewhere, right? I can look at Nicole Collins Pori right now and be like, she's got everything. She's in the club, right? And yet, and still you are navigating a challenging ecosystem. What are some of those things that have been revealed to you along the way that you had no idea existed? Well, you know, it's, it's really interesting because I think about my childhood and just journey. And I have always been the only. I mean, from secondary school being literally the only Black girl through elementary, middle, and high school. Only Black girl in my schooling. To getting these opportunities um, because I was in, I, I loved like student government and politics and stuff like that. So I would go to these camps and things like that. So like being able to go to those things to, you know, college where I found my niche because, you know, I'm a Delta. So I found my little niche, but everything, and I was a track and field runner. So I had those two niches, but everything that I was interested in or trying to make moves around or trying to build myself around, especially around social change, I would be kind of the only one in my university setting there. Then I went to work for AT&T. Only, yeah, young, black, and woman in certain amount of rooms, right? So I always just have just the reality of being an only in my trajectory, which has literally set the tone about like how I move in spaces. I think that sometimes, you know, I think, you know, people are like, well, how have you been denied access? I mean, like, literally, I'm the only. So I assume I'm denied access from the get go when I show up. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right? So it's just one of those things that, you know, for me, it's just been so, you know, like my normal. Yeah. Yeah. When you say that, like, how have you been denied access? It, it reminds me several years ago, there was this event um, called the Platform Summit, and it was in um, Boston uh, at MIT. And basically, you know, it was all these you know, venture capitalists or folks in, in startup space who were talking about how can we start to shift the paradigm. And I remember there was a panelist um, who, a white gentleman, who was talking about like how they are doing things differently. And, and a question from the audience came out and it was like, well, so if you're doing things differently, why are there still no or very few minority uh, startups in your portfolio? And uh, the gentleman went on to say, you know, we are race agnostic and we only take the best ideas. And that was the biggest mistake, right? Because what we all heard was y'all don't have good enough ideas. If you had a good idea, then you would be here. And missing the system, right? As you talk about the white supremacist system that prevents people from actually entering into that pipeline. And so as you talk about like, right, like the challenges as you're rising up the corporate ladder uh, and the tax that people are paying, I think a lot of people discount what's actually happening and they're putting it the onus on us and not recognizing how the system is preventing us. And, and I think in your um, TEDx talk um, from TEDx Oakland, which was fantastic, um, enjoyed it. Um, listeners, if you get a chance, we'll put it in the show notes. Make sure you check out Nicole's TEDx talk. Um, but you said um, things that resonated to me in, in so many ways, but it's like, you're not good enough. Uh, you don't belong. 
you don't have the right education or the right hair or the right connections. And why would you even have the audacity to ever believe in a world for endless possibilities? Like that's the world we're navigating. It's not the capability, it's that people don't think that there's the capacity, right, to actually fill those roles and therefore they're looking for somebody else. How have you along the way, knowing that, been able to carve out this amazing journey that you're on? Well, I always think about what do I need in the toolkit? For me, I have always been eye on social change and making a, a world better for folk that look like me, right? Like who did not have, you know, a mom willing to travel two hours one way to go to work so I could stay in the best school system in New Jersey or uh, athletic ability to be able to get me through college, to be able to um, get my four year degree or, you know, a mentor that introduced me to a program that allowed me to get my master's degree for, you know, like I know that I have blessing on blessing on blessing. And that is not the norm that these opportunities should one be so like, because I'm in the right place at the right time. And for me, I, you know, prayed up and, you know, been in the right situation and all that kind of stuff. I want that for everyone, especially black and brown girls. So for me, it is about like looking at what tools did I need to continue to get enough um, uh, uh, ability to help put me in position that then would give me enough influence to open the doors for others to come behind, right? So like I always thought is like when I was at at and I had to be a sheep in wolf's clothing, right? Like if I understand the speak of the corporation, I, I probably shouldn't be saying this so loud. <laughs> but like that was the thing. Like I came in as an intern. I was trying to go to law school. My sister got me a job. You know, 10 years later, I'm like thinking to myself, whoa, this company has the ability to change. And I was working on DSL. Can you imagine? High speed for all those folks <laughs> that have never had that experience. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, like I was working on like a revolutionary technology. And before the digital divide was a, like a thing, I was like sitting in the seat saying like, how come our rural and urban communities don't get this high speed thing? Okay. Why is it so expensive? <laughs> Right. So for me, the tools was like, learn the language, understand their power, understand what's important to them. Make sure you can get through the door so you can't get you're going to get if it's a no, it's going to be very hard to say no to right. getting you in the door. So that has been like my focus always through my journey is like get the tools that I need so that I can open up the doors for other folks get in the position so I can have power and influence to like write the ship while I'm there and then be able to have enough collateral or, you know, ability influence to be able to let others walk through. So what does influence look like when you're in that seat at the table and you're hearing about this life-changing technology um, that's about to be rolled out? Well, I mean, then I was like 20. <laughs> so influence that was so, different. So, so my influence, I mean, to be very honest, then my influence was not that that influential, yeah. right? Because I was new. I was coming into a company that, that wasn't even my degree focus, right? So I was sitting next to engineers and I was the kid who was told, you're not good at math and science. Mm -hmm. So I already had some like insecurity, like being in the room, trying to like lift up like some of these things like, well, what do we do with? <laughs> so my influence, I think, if I think about some of the discussions and how we moved in that space 
was what I think one of my superpowers is, is asking the right questions at the right time. So as much as I was not feeling like I could be in my full voice or utilize my full influence at that time, I think I had enough understanding and awareness of one of my own personal superpowers is always come from a place of curiosity. And when I was younger, I was very good at that. Like now <laughs> my team will be like, oh, <laughs> please don't ask us another question. But <laughs> um, but in in those that time, it would come off so casually. Folks knew it was coming truly from a pure place. So they had to at least entertain it, even if they didn't have the answer or even if they weren't going to do anything about it, it at least put the question on the table. Yes. Well, what I love where you pointed us was um, our sphere of influence evolves over time, right? As we're able to build up our social capital and, and everything else. And it's important, regardless of what stage you are on your journey, is when you're in a room, you're in the room on purpose and for a reason. And so have confidence, show up confidently, right? Get curious, ask questions, be engaged, ask for help, add to your toolkits, right? Because that's gonna to continue to prepare you along the way. And I think sometimes those spaces, because they don't want us in that, that space in the first place, um, can feel really uncomfortable. And so we show up small. We don't show up and be, aren't present because we don't want to be seen as the angry black woman or whatever else trope, whatever mm -hmm. trope shows up. And so as you were able to evolve and to continue to grow your sphere of influence, what did you learn about yourself? Mm, I mean, what I've learned a lot about myself is that I am a visionary to my core. Like I literally believe and see a better world that I'm trying to create. Like, and to be able to not only be like, here's a vision, woohoo, it's in the air, right? But then be strategic enough and know the different stakeholders and players in the game to help me achieve that vision, to speak their speak, to get them on the agenda toward my vision, right? So that has been extremely eye-opening across my career because I feel like you can get into certain rooms when you have really great ideas, but more importantly, when you those ideas can be contextualized for execution through the lens and the needs of the different players at the table. Mm -hmm. Mm, say that again. Right, <laughs> right there. Yeah. Right. Like the fact that, you know, I can, you know, be in a room and have a corporation in the room, a, you know, social justice organization in the room, a policymaker in the room, and I can speak their speak to get them aligned to help move my vision forward. That is because to your point at the very beginning, because then people feel heard. You know, people say like, you get me, you understand what, what I'm up against. And you've put that in context for where you want us to go with you. Mm. So it sounds like, right, you were able to get the sense of where you belonged, but I know you've talked a little bit about this as well. Um, I mean, you mentioned like, right, you were the only, in so many different situations. How have you been able to navigate feeling excluded throughout your life, personal, professional, and career, and getting to this point where you can actually start to lean in and be authentic and find your authentic voice? It's really interesting. Um, big shout out to um, the 1954 Project, if folks don't know what it is, but it's a, an amazing organization who is investing in um, Black leaders in the education space. And um, they brought us together a few months ago or so. And I remember sitting with my cohort and colleagues, and we were talking about 
this tension between kind of disrupting and assimilating. It's probably not the best word, but because we all are like, oh, we don't assimilate. Right. But it's to the context of like navigating the reality of the world that we live in, right? While still trying to disrupt, right? And it's this ongoing tension. And I see it almost every day that I show up for work. You have an amazing younger side of staff who wants you to be disrupting every single minute, every single moment, every day, right? And then you understand the reality of who you are as a Black woman navigating a system that was not built for you and you trying to keep the lights on and get people paid and move a big mission that is unfallible in our generation forward, right? And so I think the way that I've navigated this, because this I think is like the real navigation that folks that we may not always want to talk about, but it is our reality, is that I just had to embrace the tension and know that there's, I don't believe there's a resolve as a Black woman for that tension at least in my generation. I hope for my son's generation, I hope for the generation after, but the reality is I will always live between the two spaces of disruption and assimilation. And what I do or how I use it as a strategy not a way of being is what I need to um, embrace more than the resolve of it. Yes, yes. Well, I love what you just pointed to with that tension between disruption and assimilation, right? Um, And those are some of the complexities that as Black women we have to, to navigate. And it's such a nuanced thing, is in order for us to be in the room, we have to belong in that room and people have to feel like they can trust us, that we're vulnerable, they can connect with us, right? And so we have to show up a certain way to be able to build that social capital. And that sometimes feels like assimilation. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter to your point is right now in this current day and age, if we aren't in the room, change is not gonna happen. And we are the ones that can create the change. Right, so we have to be able to be in that room, but we have to also have to point to what needs to be disrupted. Right, um, that, and I think this is what the onus for the show is. I think so often people will see a Nicole Collins Pori, right, or Angela Taylor, or um, uh, Latanya Story, or Renee Brown, all these people, and be like, "Y'all are fine," but you, you, you guys didn't have it hard. I actually had a colleague inside of COVID um, in the social justice movement after George Floyd's murder say, but but you didn't have it that difficult, did you? Like, and I was like, times 10, I just didn't tell you. And so just because we don't speak the full story doesn't mean that that's not happening. And I think of us being able to share our stories more is gonna help unlock some of those truths, right? And the things that need to be disrupted. Um, because just because we're successful doesn't mean that the road isn't more difficult than it needs to be. And, and a road that is allowing for those other lost nine signs to, to make it down um, as, as well as we are. And so for you in this complex space that we're navigating, how do you kind of move all those chess pieces? You know, I think it depends on the day, hmm. on how you move, because Sometimes you got to make a choice about what battle you're willing to fight in this moment. And remember when we first started this conversation, right? I have two people and extended that need my energy to be positive and to be available for them. So I think it depends on the moment. It depends on the risk 
It depends on what's at stake. It depends on do you need to be the one that has to create the heavy lift or can somebody else, an ally, someone else that you trust, create the lift for you? So I think it depends. I think it's just as complex as us as you know navigating this space. It's never a clear like playbook about when we disrupt and when we have to get our foot in the door so that we can disrupt. Um, so I, I don't think I have a good answer for that. I think it just depends. I think about um, some of the conversations that I've been having in our organization around, um, especially with our partners around belonging. And, you know, we, we put so much emphasis in our industry, STEM industry, around representation. And I know why, because it's easy. You can count heads, you can see if you're doing better. It's a tangible thing, right? I get it. But the reality is, is like you can't get to representation until you get a sense of belonging or you're creating those sense of belonging. So I, 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 <laughs> juggling with just as our funders ask us for our data mm. and our impact. I would be curious if some of them would give us their internal data, not the representation data, your employee satisfaction data disaggregated by race and gender okay. and let us see that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like, could you let us see that to see, you know, all of the dollars that you were whirling around your DEIB um, initiatives, you know, hiring practices, all of the things. How is that investment turning over for the culture in which you're creating for a sense of belonging for the girls that I'm preparing to come there, but I'm preparing for them to assess whether you are worthy of their belonging okay. in the first place. Okay. That's when we right? put the script, script like, right? Yeah. It's really looking yeah. at you. You're no longer just looking at us for, right, filling that pipeline, but we're looking at you. Or, do you deserve? Do you deserve this brilliance? Do you deserve this genius? I mean... I, I will never be sad about being black woman. I think it's the most extraordinary thing in the whole entire God's creation. Like, I don't, you know, like literally I am, it is just a wonder what we do. And so I think about like, nothing is, nothing can stop us other than the systems and like the barriers in which you create to make us like jump higher hit harder, stop stronger, right? Like, but nothing's gonna stop us from doing what we have intended and we can do. Yeah, well, and, and that's real talk, right? I mean, the truth of the matter is the systems and structures are in place to try to make it difficult for more Nicole Collins Pories to, to show up, for more excellence to be in the room. And, the fact that society, right, doesn't recognize what's going on is really frustrating, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that could be debilitating in a way where you're like, why do I even show up, right? Because nothing is going to change. What keeps you showing up in those boardrooms? Mm. Well, my girls, I think about, you know, our Eileen's or Sarah's who started with us in elementary school stayed with us through high school, went off to college, came back to volunteer now in their own STEM professions. Like we created a possible vision and future for them as an organization. And I know I work every single day to work myself out of a job. If I could not, if Tech Rich Girls could not exist because it is not needed, yeah. not because of yeah. any other reason, yeah. because it's not needed in the world yeah. to ensure that 
STEM education is working for black and brown girls yeah. across this country. Like if that is no longer needed, that is what I'm trying. That's what motivates me. Mm. I'm, I'm motivated to work myself out of the job and in store more Eileen's and Sarah's are able to thrive and achieve that aspiration of that seed that we planted with them so, so many years ago. Well, see, and this is what's different about black women. I just had this conversation. We had our team um, meeting earlier today with the Dignitas Agency. And my business partner, Stacy said that exact same thing is um, to our interns, is our hope that through our work with the Dignitas Agency is that we work ourselves out of a job. And what we're seeing today to our left and to our right in corporate America is people trying to hold on to power and onto jobs versus sharing the power. And I. This, the consistent message with all the women that I'm talking to on Unlocking the Club is this thought of, if I win, you win, we win. But that is who we are and what we're about. And that's not necessarily what we receive in society. So how can you stay motivated in this space where you're like, look, I'm working myself on a job. I'm making sure all these, these girls and young people have opportunities and yet and still, we don't have the support that we need to be able to build that. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, Angela. And the reality for me is this is purpose-driven work for me. I think about my journey from AT&T to the College Board to the Women's Foundation. That's not happenstance that I worked in tech, education, and philanthropy to lead a nonprofit focused on getting girls a better STEM education so that they can get into tech. I know for sure that I am here for a purpose, a reason, and I know I'm here for a season. And that until that work is done, that I'm supposed to be here. And it's not all gravy. Being a nonprofit leader is not one of those top 10 jobs with glamour and gravitas, right? Like it just is not because I'm not a $20 million nonprofit with 50 to 100 plus staff members, you know, I don't have that. So I'm like the majority of what nonprofits are. And the reality is, is I've been able to tap into this work, regardless if it was labeled TechBridge Girls or however it was packaged, I know to the core that this is the purpose-driven work that I was called to do in this season. So that's what keeps me motivated because it's bigger than me right like i do believe i am a servant i believe that i am put in places and spaces for a reason and until i'm told to move i'm supposed to stay still and do my work um that i've been asked to do or given the opportunity to do so for me that's what keeps me motivated it really is beyond just what's the work in front of me, but it is literally the foundation of what the work is doing for the communities in which we're serving. Wow. So powerful, right? The purpose, the reason, and the season. And when you said earlier, right, that there was a point in your journey where you thought that you wanted to get into the club, whatever the proverbial club is, um, but now, but now what? Like, what is the club that you belong to or that you want to get into or the club that you want to unlock? Yeah. So from a very young age, I think my mom said, I don't know if it was like five or seven. And I'm not even sure why this was um, came into my spirit. Like there's nothing like that I recall in my childhood that made me want this. But I wanted to be the president of the United States like forever. Like I... I mean, reflecting now, I, I think I understood it because I've always wanted to be able to make change mm. for certain communities. Okay. And I thought that's what the president had the ability to do. That's the only person that really could do that. But under all of that was really about 
being in a position of leadership that had the influence and the positioning to make change, right? And I think about my ability to navigate over the years to see like, hmm, what did I ultimately want to be back then? And this club called Leadership Mm -hmm. is what I wanted to go into. And now that I'm in it, officially, I feel like you always, you know, if you possess leadership qualities without the title, you're still a leader, right? So what I learned was that my leadership didn't always fall so tightly with the way the books written in That's it. Yep. and the leadership that allowed me to navigate to the space to be in this leadership does not fully allow me to show up in my full authentic self and if I do it always feels like a wrestling mm-hmm. and just not like let me just be yeah So this club of leadership that I've been, you know, driving toward for the majority of my life and then getting closer and closer to what it is from the book sense of it doesn't fit well with me. It doesn't settle me to be who I know I should be as a leader even though it doesn't fall tightly and squarely as folks think it should look like. So the, 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 the club I'm trying to unlock is like this kind of club, Mm -hmm. right? Being surrounded by more black women, women of color who are transforming their leadership, amplifying those attributes of what leadership looks like through our lens, our experiences, and leaning into that unapologetically so that we can, to your point, show up in ways that we discard our past. I mean, it's, it's, I always think about like, I'm not, I always like, I'm not a very good storyteller because like, because like sometimes I'm like, eh, I'm going to tell that story. It's the same old story, all the barriers, all the things, right? Like, but the reality is, is like, I would be more willing to tell it if people really care to listen to it. And I feel like the alternative club, I don't know if they really want to listen to it. Yes. Yes. Spot on. Right. And that is why I think the lesson here is we can aspire, right. To, to do those things because it gives us access and the resources to, to figure out what we want to do with our, our talents. But it is so comforting to be in a space, and it sounds like the the 1954 project and the people that are in that space with you, like to be in that space where you can be yourself, you can find your voice, you can lean into your expertise, you can share and grow and all the complexities that we have about being a Black woman and the nuances um, that we've had to, to, to have along this journey, it feels like your home, right? And, and that's what I'm hoping to, from these conversations, like be able to convey to our allies and our accomplices to say, here's, here's who Black women truly are. And you can find out about leadership through Nicole Collins Corey, like, right, and her journey. Like, if you're able to replicate some of the things that Nicole has done, you will be a great leader no matter what your identity. And I think that, unfortunately, like right now, we're looking at white men, right, um, as the only model and characteristics um, of like what leadership looks like. And there's so many black women that are strong, that are caretakers, that are visionaries, right? That are fighters, that are like, like have all the qualities that you would want in someone that you wanna follow. And um, what I've learned and appreciated along this way and, and, and the same is true in, in the conversation I'm having thus far with you, Nicole, is um, you all are remarkable people and humans and we are in these organizations that you work in are better off because of who you are and how you show up on a regular basis. So thank you for the work that you're doing with Tech Bridge Girls. 
Uh, and I look forward to finding out a little bit more about Nicole and the journey that she's on here in a moment on Unlocking the Club as we hit the back nine. Do you want to stop feeling like you have little to no control over your life's journey and instead amplify your life's purpose? You all know me as Angela Taylor, host of the Unlocking the Club podcast, but I am also a business, career, life, and leadership coach, helping my clients to live their best life. Every day, I help my clients discover what they truly want in life and then unlock the club on how they can live their best life. If you're like many of my clients, you have found yourself over the years prioritizing everyone else and everything else, your job, your significant other, your family, your friends, your community, the list goes on and on. Well, I'm here to tell you the best thing you can do for others is to invest in yourself. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't need to succumb to the fear of failure. You don't have to be perfect. You don't need to feel like you're being selfish. You simply need to prioritize you. You may be thinking that coaching is for other people, but trust me when I say that we all could benefit from a good coaching relationship. Together, we'll build a plan to help you amplify your gifts, clarify your goals, and accelerate your journey toward the life you desire, which may be finding financial wealth, spiritual health, relationship success, and or freedom and flexibility. You no longer have to feel like you aren't welcome into someone else's club. Let me empower you to leverage all of your extraordinary gifts and create your own club. Head on over to unlockingtheclub.com to book a free 20-minute introductory call to learn more about our Unlocking Your Journey coaching packages or use code UNLOCK to get a 15% discount on the six-month coaching package. Today is the day to invest in yourself. Let's unlock your journey. Welcome back to Unlocking the Club. I'm your host, Angela Taylor. I'm here with Nicole collins Pori. We're on the back nine and want to find out a little bit more, Nicole, about who you are and who you've had to be uh, along your amazing journey. Uh, one of the things that resonated with me is as you talked about, again, the evolution um, as you're finding your, your voice. And I wonder, besides your own home, right, with your seven-year-old and your husband, or where do you find um, safety in being yourself? That's a really great question. Um, you know, as a Christian woman, I find a lot of solitude and peace and rest and validation because I think that's something that you mentioned about, you know, black um, women in leadership, black women in leadership of being in home, like a feeling of home together. But it's also about validation of like who you are, regardless of how you show up. So, you know, um, I mean, it's been interesting because I moved back east right before the pandemic. Yeah. So I haven't found a new church home. <laughs> so anybody in the you know, Philly area, let you know, uh, let me know. Um, but, uh, you know, that has always been my place of, of kind of rest and peace and feeling like I can be my full self. And all that I come in surrender in that space. Um, I also feel like my family, they just love me just with all of my extraness. <laughs> you know, my mom is an amazing powerhouse woman. She is the foundation of what I have learned and who I am and who I've become. Um, and, you know, she just lets me, you know, be me in okay. all of my, you know, <laughs> wanting to tell her how to like manage yeah. her health. <laughs> that thing. Um, Cause I'm in that age, that sandwich age right now to, you know, being able to laugh and like see each other as women. Um, and, you know, to just also just have a mommy when I need a mommy, even at this age, right? And so I feel like my mom, my sister, my grandmother, they have a lot of patience and love, <laughs> and they know how to translate my, like, my little bit rough edges 
in a way that they know it's coming from a loving place. Um, and so I feel like, you know, when I'm with my family, I can always just be. And the good thing is, is because they have always been there for me too. So I never have to question if something will tug them or, you know, make them fly away, you know, fly away from me for a bit because they just continue to show up for me and vice versa in all of my phases and evolution um, of my life. So I say, you know, my church family, which I still have back in the Bay Area and, you know, my, you know, biological family and extended family through my in-laws, um, you know, are kind of my two go-to. Folks don't know, but like, I feel like I'm an introvert too. People don't believe it, but I, I, I am, this is about okay. energy thing. So if I'm around a lot of people, like I am exhausted, like being at, like I am the person in the bathroom, typing myself <laughs> up, ready to go into the conference or like event or whatever that I know I got to like work the room. Um, but so I, I really am kind of a homebody and really rest in those, you know, family and really close friends um, to be kind of my go-to. Yeah. Have you found inside of COVID that you are actually prioritizing um, your energy? Oh, yes. Um, my mantra at the beginning of, of, of COVID was like, protect yes. my peace. Um, because you, first of all, the world was in like an uproar and everything from not only COVID, but the racial unrest that was happening in the, uh, in the country, like the like political landscape, you know, things that were happening in our communities, um, the pull that we were seeing on our girls during COVID. And the reality is, is that I had to th think a little bit more and I tried to get away from this in my life or my early life is to compartmentalize yeah. things but I think I had it was almost like a survival type of skill that I needed to do during COVID so that I would be able to protect and create boundaries and have peace and the energy that I needed to give to the different things that were pulling at me um, during that time. Yeah I, I was the same and, and I probably hadn't realized how much I needed that. I'm very similar to you, an introvert in an extroverted world. Um, like I got to know you through your husband, Ash, like we were both in the sports world together, right? And like you had to constantly show up, right? And so as I was running these WNBA teams, I was always having to give and give. And that was exhausting in a way that was debilitating, but I didn't know it until COVID. Right, because it had just mm -hmm. been the formula. It's just what you do. It's how you show up. It's what's expected for you in that definition of leadership. And mm -hmm. in COVID, I realized that my my tank was empty. Like, right, and it wouldn't get filled up the next day. Like, right, I, just even a you know six hours, eight hours of sleep wasn't helping me fill up. And so I started to guard, like, right, what I needed that time and space. And I'm not still not doing it well but i think we all need to listen to ourselves and and covid gave us that pause to actually start to mm -hmm. notice what we needed to be whole uh, and so i think that's a really good point and the other point I, I love that you mentioned when you have your church family and you have your your family family um i think it's really important for us as black women to be there for one another like we hear so often right about you know does anybody have my back Mm -hmm. And the, the truth of the matter is oftentimes in the workplace, particularly when you're one of the only or very few, there's not going to be a lot of people that truly have your back. So we have to be there for one another because that person that you're looking at across the room is probably having a very similar lived experience. And, and what Nicole has just shared is how important being able to be and to be yourself and to be yourself fully is. So let's create that space for each other, if only for a moment. Like, let's create that space for each other because no one else is going to do it for ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the next question, uh, I get curious about this, too, because obviously we're all on learning journeys. Um, but what is the situation that you still walk into with trepidation? Yeah, I think the 
situation that I walk into trepidation is the balance of being compassionate and direct. Mm. That's the thing. Um, that thing. Mm, I'm not too good. <laughs> I mean, I am, I am extremely empathetic. I am extremely compassionate. But again, if you think about the work that I've been doing for the last, this is like purpose driven. So when I see nonsense and when I just need to get to the solution, like that compassion thing starts to fall real far. <laughs> feels a little from remembrance. <laughs> um, and so I feel like, you know, having tough conversations that continue to ensure that there's a level of compassion, but also still care with the words for directness mm -hmm. um, is something that I continue to evolve, be conscious of, um, I'm always grateful. I have a really amazing leadership team um, that will check me on that because they know it is a, a place of growth for me. Um, and I appreciate that mm -hmm. because I am a person who leads a lot with my heart. So I never want folks to feel like I don't see them mm -hmm. in a um, situation that creates directness needed, but not forgiving the compassion that goes with it. Well, when you think about that juxtaposition between directness and compassion, how much does the trope of the angry black woman sit in the back of your mind um, when you think about how you, how you navigate that with grace? That, I mean, that's, that's a really great question about like, how, how do you like manage the, the trope and the reality of like being directness? Yeah. <laughs> we still need to be direct. And I don't know if it's conscious in me, but I'm sure it is a very subconscious in me. Right? Because think about it. The club, in many ways, mm -hmm. the one that we don't want to be about, a mm -hmm. part of anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Is to make other people feel comfortable. Yeah. And when you're having direct conversations, and again, the amazingness of Black women, we just know how to read and just blow words yep. Yep. so sharply <laughs> and clearly sometimes. Like that, it becomes not being angry, but it's just about being directness. So I know that is a subconscious thing in me. I think it's a subconscious because the reality is, is that I am supposed to exist in the world to make other people comfortable with me existing in the world, but that's not what what I'm trying to like reflect yeah. anymore in this in this journey. Yeah, and I think so often people conflate, uh, and they actually, frankly, use it as an excuse, like the focus on the angry black woman versus receiving the information, right? Yeah, and and I do think that it has uh, many black women measure how, when, how often um, that they share a really important bit of information, right? Um, and so being able to figure out how you can navigate the two and, and still be in compassion, um, but uh, not always prioritizing someone else's comfort when you're delivering some really important information is a really challenging space. So if anyone has a formula or the book on that one, let us know for sure. <laughs> I will sign up and pay extra. Exactly. <laughs> webinar, <laughs> TED Talk, whatever it is. Like, right, I, I want to know how you navigate that. Uh, Nicole, what's something about yourself that you refuse to hide? Uh, I refuse to hide my heart. Mm, wow. Um, I think that the good or bad, like, even when I try, <laughs> that it is really hard to do. Um, I lead with it. I, I, am, I feel not only like what I feel, but I feel through it, other people. And it's oftentimes what I am uh, reacting or addressing versus what the words out of somebody's mouth is. So I actually think it's one of those strengths 
and superpowers in my toolkit um, that as much as, you know, vulnerability, I think is a different thing, <laughs> but my heart really does lead my care for people, my sense of like connecting with people through our heart energy um, is where I start. Um, and that has gotten me where I am today more than, you know, anything else. So that's one thing I won't hide. Mm. When you said that your heart is your superpower, what else, what are your other superpowers and how do you um, use those for good? You know, I, I always tell um, folks that I am kind of the puzzle person, right? So you can have all these things on the table. They don't look like they all belong to each other, but I will figure out how to make them connected, interconnected, um, tell a cohesive story, be able to bring it together into one vision. And so I think that has been based on a, um, I remember my first feedback that I got in at AT&T during my performance review is that my boss wanted me to be more of a strategic thinker and a strategic thinker knows how to like see various things and kind of bring them all together. And because that was like one of my first tangible feedbacks that I ever gotten, I think I got obsessed with that mm. thing. And now it's become like strategic thinking, being that puzzle piece put her together <laughs> um, is like a superpower that I have. I mean, many people will also say, you know, just my conviction and passion for whatever I'm doing. We get this amazing life to do what we were intended to do. And I do whatever I was intended to do in that moment, in that season, with a high level of conviction and passion. And I think that that ultimately translates to folks seeing me, being willing to come along with me on rides, and being able to be willing to support me. Um, and so I think that's also a superpower. Yeah, when well, there's so many things that you shared today, right? That reinforces everything that you've talked about and the work that you're doing. So um, the heart, right? Of being that being the superpower leads into the conviction and the passion that you have and how you show up. Um, the curiosity that you spoke about earlier, right? Helps being that strategic thinker. Like you're asking those questions, the right questions to help to get to those answers, um, to come up with a big vision. So um, definitely see how that has led you to where you are having an impact in tech philanthropy, nonprofit space, and certainly with these young um, people in the STEM field. So that's amazing to hear. As you like look to whatever is next for, for Nicole, um, when you're at your best and however you would define your best, what does that look like and how do you want to leverage that moving forward? When I'm feeling and at my best, I am working in a space where I'm making something good great. Like, I feel like that is my, that's my hanger. Like, if you want Nicole to come in, she can make something that is already, you know, got the right bones, um, but needs to be taken to that next level. That is um, Nicole. And why that environment and space brings out like what I love and enjoy most is literally because it allows me to do those superpower things, right? It lets me to be strategic. It allows me to bring different folks together so I can lead with my heart and be able to understand from that perspective. It allows me to like be curious. It allows me to like, um, you know, be open and and taking a risk and taking those traditional leadership and the non-traditional leadership skills um, into play. And so I think when I think about what's next or think about uh, what brings out my best self is when I'm put in those positions 
but then surrounded by folks who allow me to stretch and learn and fail and not be able to, you know, have the right answer, but will be a part of this journey and evolution and giving me grace in doing that. Mm. Mm. Very well said. Very well said. One last thing that I'm curious about for you is, and and you told the story in, in the TEDx um, talk about a young woman that had been in the program and that had gone on to graduate from Cal Berkeley and, um, and was doing all these amazing things and yet and still didn't have an opportunity, right? Particularly in spaces that are always saying there's not enough women in the pipeline, not enough black or brown people in the pipeline. And you talked about social capital. Like, right, that it was the relationship. She had the capacity and the capability and the competency, but the social capital was something that was missing. I wonder, as you are navigating this space around STEM, um, particularly STEM for girls, is um, like, what's missing? What's the story that needs to be told? The story that needs to be told, I think, reflects back to the focus on representation versus belonging. The reality is there is no research, no data point, no survey, no report that says our girls are not performing, if not better or equal pace as male counterparts. So this is not a capability thing, right? So this is really about one, are we giving her the opportunities to access STEM education that is reflective of her experiences, her lineages, and reflective of who she is in her community? And she can reflect back on that through the STEM concepts so she has re relevance to that. And then are we creating a space that has not made room was created with her experience and brilliance and genius in the mind from the get go. Yes. I think that we need to come off of the fact that we are trying to put, I know our tech bridge girls in a, you know, circle in a, well, you know, that metaphor. Yeah. Right. Like we don't want the square in there. Yes. Because unlike I love my Shirley Chisholm, I don't want our girls to bring a folding chair. Yeah. Yeah. Like the table needs to be set with them in mind and the, yeah. from the get go. The comfortable seats. Yes. That's ergo that was not make right. right. Like right. Get on exactly. <laughs> I had you in mind. And here is your seat that makes you feel like home, but also validated. So you can help us thrive and grow in this industry. So like for me, that's what's missing. It's like access to relevant STEM education that reflects back the ancestors and lineage that have already paved the way for our girls, that has already contributed to this industry, that just has not been validated and uplifted for what they have actually done. And then setting a table that had our girls in mind when the table was even thought of so that she doesn't have to find her way into a seat, but the seat was, is ready for her to come and sit in. Mm, the seat is ready for her to come sit in. Preach. And that is period point blank. Amazing. So Nicole, where can people find you? What projects are you working on currently? Um, well, individuals can find me, of course, Nicole with a K, Collins Pori on LinkedIn, um, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, you can visit me and see what our amazing organization is doing at techbridgegirls.org, techbridgegirls.org, because there's also another tech bridge out there <laughs> with a CEO named Nicole. So I always like to say techbridgegirls.org. Um, um, and we're doing some really amazing things. We're embarking over the next month, um, starting in the beginning of December, a STEM equity learning community cohort for out-of-school time educators to really give them the tools to effectively engage our youth, but also assess 
it's how they are showing up for our youth and giving them the tools to learn how to um, be a true advocate for our girls, but also help champion through their their path to persistence in STEM. Mm, fantastic. So if you get a chance, head on over to techbridgegirls.org, find out about the wonderful work that Nicole and her team are doing for our next generation of leaders and visionaries and inventors. Uh, thank you, Nicole, so much for the work that you're doing, for showing up today. I would say that your willingness to be candid and honest and speak real talk took this conversation from a good conversation to a great conversation. And I know that that's who you are, from good to great, um, is how you are, how you've always been, and will continue to be. So thank you so much for joining us on Unlocking the Club. Thank you, Angela. It's been a pleasure. Well, I know I say this after every episode, but another wonderful conversation. Uh, so grateful to Nicole for joining me today and talking about the work that uh, she's doing with um, TechBridge girls um, in, the, in the STEM space, but also her journey. Um, just a really riveting conversation and story that she has had about her journey and the perspective that has evolved over time as she continues to pursue her purpose uh, and her reason uh, in this particular season. And hopefully you all continue to think about those spaces that you can be there for one another as Black women, as allies and accomplices for Black women or those who identify as Black and female. How can you show up so that um, we can just be where we can be seen and heard and valued in different spaces? How can you make sure that there's not a folding chair, but there is a comfortable chair at the table uh, for uh, black and brown girls and women who have a voice and a perspective and something to share and a story to tell. Uh, that's what Unlocking the Club is about. Let's start to actually build and create our own club. And it starts with you. It starts with the work that you're doing and it starts with the conversations you're having. And it starts with um, the spaces that you create for, for black women to be as amazing as they all are. And so I am so appreciative to Nicole and all of the guests that we've had on Unlocking the Club for them sharing their story and telling us how we can continue to unlock and create this, this new club, if you will. Uh, and if you want to continue the conversation, head on over to our Facebook page, the Code Breakers Lounge, where we'll continue this conversation, dig a little bit deeper into those lost Einsteins, how we can be advocates for young people who are bright and intelligent and talented and just need social capital and the resources and tools to be able to do what they can do very well. And so for another episode of Unlocking the Club, I'm your host, Angela Taylor. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, be well. Thanks for listening to Unlocking the Club. If this conversation resonated with you, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or your favorite streaming platform so that you can experience every episode. And follow us on social media where you'll hear about future guests, access special features, and connect with this amazing community. Head on over there and let us know how you are unlocking the club. Until next time, peace.